everybody. Firstly, thank you very much for spending the next hour with us. Um, I know everyone's time is valuable, so I'll be as to the point as possible and make every slide you see today as valuable and as informative as we can. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to take care of real quick. Um, first of all, yes, everybody will get a PDF with today's presentation emailed them, uh, emailed to them in, uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll also send out a survey. We'd appreciate if you could fill that out for us as well. Uh, in Zoom, you'll see that uh, there are a couple of interactive features that you can use. Uh, some of you have discovered the chat, which is good. The chat is kind of open for everybody, a, a little bit of a free for all, if you will. Uh, if you would like to ask any specific question to be answered by the QLab staff, I have Andy Francis, uh, who's at the QLab headquarters in Westlake, Ohio right now. So Andy will be here answering questions. So please instead use that Q&A feature, which is separate from the chat. We might address some of the most common questions that we get. And we'll also stay on for some time after the webinar to answer any questions that you may have via the Q&A. All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, very quickly about Thermaline. We are a family owned and operated business located in Western Sydney. Uh, Thermaline was founded in 1970. So this year we're celebrating 50 years and um, we've been the QLab distributor in Australia and New Zealand since 2016. We're a manufacturer of laboratory and environmental testing equipment, including uh, temperature and humidity, plant growth and drying cabinets and the such. Oh, going too far. The QLab Corporation were founded in 1956 and specialize in weathering and corrosion test services and products. Uh, you can see on this slide here, there are four facilities worldwide. Uh, QLab are headquartered in Westlake, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. There are also facilities in the UK, in China, and in Germany. QLab have several outdoor weathering sites, including the world's largest outdoor weathering site in Miami. Uh, that's more of a subtropical type environment. There's also a desert environment out in Phoenix, Arizona. You can see that dry desert looking site in that top right photo. Um, in Westlake, it's not currently snowing. There's a there's a photo they're taking during the winter, but it's reflective of the four seasons that they have over there. What we're going to talk about today is uh, some of the basics of weathering, what we call the forces of weathering. So that's sunlight, heat and water, and just how they impact materials outdoors and in other service environments. We'll try to determine why people want to perform laboratory weathering. I'm sure some of you have already um, have some idea of what you want out of a test program, but we'll just talk about some of the reasons why people turn to laboratory weathering. We'll give an overview of the two most common techniques used for laboratory weathering testing. That's the xenon arc devices and fluorescent UV devices. And I'll spend most of the presentation on that. And then towards the end, uh, we'll kind of wrap everything up and present the basic elements of what we consider to be an effective testing program. So keep in mind that what constitutes an effective program is going to be a uh, different customer to customer. So let's define the weathering up front. What is weathering? What do we mean when we say weathering? So for us, it's a combination of the three main factors. That's sunlight, heat and water. So anytime you have sunlight, whether that's an outdoor spectrum facing the sun directly or behind window glass or otherwise uh, modified in combination with heat, which can include elevated temperatures as well as temperature cycling, plus water, um, which can be present as moisture in the air, as relative humidity or condensation or as rainfall. When those three forces combine to degrade a material or cause some change in the material's properties, that's what we refer to as weathering. I want to talk about each of these individually and how they uh, impact materials. So as you can see from the small comment there at the bottom, there are other factors outdoors. There's wind, there's acid rain, there's pollution, there's cloud cover, 
We're not going to focus on those today as those aren't really things that we can simulate well in a laboratory environment. Let's kick off with sunlight. Sunlight is, of course, a form of energy. So sunlight arrives on Earth as electromagnetic radiation. And I'll just make a comment on terminology. So QLab typically use sunlight or light to refer to the entire spectrum, including ultraviolet light, visible light, and infrared light. Some uh, in the industry prefer the term radiation when not speaking about visible light. I'm going to use the two interchangeably. In both cases, we're talking about photons reaching specimens, okay? So however you want to treat it as radiation, as light, however you want to think about it, it's photons of different wavelengths in different energies impacting specimens. And when we describe sunlight, the character of light on specimens, we talk about both the irradiance, so that's the intensity level, as well as the wavelength, okay? An easy way to look at this is via the electromagnetic spectrum. Here we have everywhere from zero to a thousand nanometers. So obviously this goes further in the short wavelength direction as well as in the long wavelength uh, direction. But for natural sunlight here on earth, the area that we're most concerned with is indicated by that bracket. You can see that most of the sun reaching the earth's surface is in the visible region, about 55% of the sun's energy we can see. And that's not by accident. That's how our eyes have evolved, of course, to be able to see that light. So infrared light extends from 800 nanometers up to, uh, let's say, 3000. So that's going to be more heat. It's going to be past that red area. That's another close to 40%. And there's this small portion below 400 nanometers from about, uh, we'll say, 298, 295 nanometers up to 400 of ultraviolet. And we see that that's only about 7% of the total sunlight spectrum in terms of total irradiance. That's where we'll focus on quite a bit today. The reason is, even though it's only a small portion of the total energy of sun, it's the portion that by far does the most damage to durable materials. When you have polymer degradation of paints, of plastics, uh, other durable materials outdoors, it's almost entirely, in most cases, the ultraviolet light that's causing that damage. So when we talk about light spectra and when we talk about laboratory weathering devices, we tend to focus on how they generate the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum, what wavelengths they have, what irradiance they have and how they're controlled. I'll define a couple of terms that we're going to use really quickly before we uh, really get into looking at light spectra. So the first is irradiance and a radiance you can think of as a power density. It's the rate at which light energy falls on a surface and an energy rate is a power, right? So in this case, we usually express this in watts per square meter or joules per, se per second per square meter. So either way, it's a power density. Now, if we want to look at irradiance over a period of time, then that becomes an energy and we call that either radiant exposure or light exposure or radiant dosage. So we would multiply an irradiance over a period of time and we get energy density joules per meter squared or watt seconds per meter squared. And when we consider the entire spectrum of an artificial light source or a natural light source, we will call that spectral irradiance. And that is the irradiance again, that power density, but for each unit wavelength. So what is the spectral irradiance at 400 nanometers or at 500 nanometers and so on? When we look at spectral irradiance, we look at it here, as you see on slide 14, with uh, what's sometimes called a spectral power distribution. And what you're looking at is a representation of the spectrum of the sun. And I'll spend a little time on this, as we'll see a number of these throughout. On the x-axis, we have the wavelength of the light ranging from 250 to 800. On the y-axis, we have the uh, irradiance at each wavelength, right? So it's a graph of spectral irradiance. In this case, we're looking at two plots. One is a table from a document called CIE85, which is a reference table for noon summer sunlight spectrum. This would represent a very sunny day where the sun is high in the sky. And the green light is a model called the SMARTS2 model. And that's uh, an ASTM standard called G177 that also defines reference spectra. Again, 
you can see that most of the spectrum is visible. So 400 to 800 nanometers. We have this small portion in the UV from 300 to 400. Most of that is in the UVA. So very little that reaches the Earth's surface is in UVB and none in the UVC, which is a good thing for us humans because light with wavelengths below about 250 nanometers starts to break down DNA, which would not be so great for us. So you can thank the ozone layer for the shape of this particular spectrum. Uh, not all solar spectra on Earth are the same, of course. We know that time of year can affect it. So the sun looks a little different in the summer than it does in autumn or spring or even winter. The sun also changes by the time of day. So in the morning and the evening sun, they have a different character than the noon sun. And your position on Earth also matters where the sun at the equator has a different spectrum typically than the sun high in the north or high in the south. If you're in North Queensland or in Melbourne or in New Zealand and the altitude that you're at, if you're in an aeroplane or up in a mountain, that can also have some impact on the spectrum. It's important to consider how window glass affects sunlight. A lot of products aren't exposed outdoors, they're exposed behind window glass. So think of products that are in storefronts, for, for instance. Um, you can see that the dashed line, which is sunlight through window glass as compared to the sod line, which is a natural daylight spectrum. And outdoors has a big difference, especially in the ultraviolet. So instead of having what we call a cut on wavelength or sort of that beginning of that curve around 298 nanometers behind window glass, that doesn't begin until about 310 nanometers. And that may not sound like a big difference, 10 to 15 nanometers, but for weathering behavior, it can make a huge difference. Again, it's those very short wavelengths, particularly in the UV that have the most impact on weathering. And by filtering those out, window glass can significantly reduce the amount of photo oxidation and damage that the specimen sees. And not all glass is exactly the same, as you know. So here, if we compare an outdoor sunlight spectrum, that's that black line at far left to the clear glass, which are, which are spectra A and B, we can see a significant shift to longer wavelengths in terms of the cut-on. Again, that can have a big difference in weathering behavior. And you'll notice that A and B are 3.3 millimeters and 5.8 millimeter thick glass. Not a big difference between the two of those. So the thickness doesn't matter a whole lot. What does matter if you look at lines C and D's tinted glass. So here the cut on has shifted to very long wavelengths, 340 and 335 nanometers. Again, a difference of 35 nanometers may not seem big, but in terms of weathering behavior, tinted glass is going to make a very large difference for, uh, for many products. Now we've moved now to the second force of weathering. So let's consider heat now. Heat can have a number of different effects on specimens. Obviously, it can increase the temperature of specimens as they absorb heat from the sun. And this can cause dimensional change, so you can have expansion and contraction as the temperature changes throughout the day. Heat can cause water to evaporate. If you have uh, materials that are very porous, for instance, that material evaporates and can cause differential absorption and shrinkage throughout the day. Um, thermal aging, if a specimen gets hot, if they're at elevated temperatures for long periods of time, they may even start to soften. So thermal cycling needs to be considered as well. So is there thermal shock? Uh, are there physical effects from going from relatively high temperatures then to low temperatures and back and forth in a short period of time? The way we think of heat is that it typically doesn't initiate a reaction. That's going to be the light that does that. But the heat is often going to accelerate that reaction. And a lot of chemical reaction that takes place during weathering happens faster or more severely in high temperature environments, which is why most accelerated lab tests do take place at higher temperatures. So here's one example. This is oxidation of a polymer polyethylene. You can see pretty clearly that as the temperature is increased from 10 to 30 to 50 degrees, the oxygen uptake, which is a measurement of the amount of degradation of the oxidation of this polymer, it increases pretty sharply in an accelerated test. And this isn't always the case. Some materials are relatively insensitive to temperature changes in weathering. Some may even have the opposite behavior, but this is not uncommon to see an increase in weathering behavior in degradation as temperatures increase. In addition to this temperature, 
we also consider thermal cycling. So for one example, Florida is pretty hot and sunny uh, most of the time. Florida is also prone to frequent rain showers that are kind of short. And these can cause temperature swings of up to 50 degrees Celsius in just two minutes. So that can cause a lot of physical stress, can cause cracking and other failures of materials. Materials that are particularly susceptible to this are coatings, right? So if you have a differential stress between a coating and the substrate that it's on, whether that's a plastic or a metal or some assembly, that can cause delamination or cracking and all sorts of other failure types. We should also consider uh, the color effects of temperature. So these two plots show different colors of specimens relative to a black specimen. So for a panel exposed with its back open to the atmosphere, this is that left side and it's back to the plywood for insulation. This is the right panel. In each case, we're comparing different colors as indicated on the graph to a black specimen, okay? The black is at zero, and as we move from blue to green to red to the lighter colors like orange and yellow, and finally to white, we can see a significant difference between the temperature of those colored panels and a black specimen. We all know that black absorbs a lot more heat from the sun than white, but it's interesting to see that the difference can be 15 degrees Celsius or more. And for panels that are cooled on their back, um, when panels are insulated as in that right side, the difference can be even greater, up to 25 degrees Celsius between black and white specimens. The final heat aspect to consider is in indoor environments, so behind window glass. And this is particularly interesting for vehicles. So behind window glass, anyone that sat in a car on a hot day knows this, but vehicle interior parts like your steering wheel or your instrument panel or dashboard, these can exceed 100 degrees, which again can have a significant impact on how quickly they weather. The third factor of weathering to consider is water. And this is often the most overlooked factor in weathering, particularly in laboratory accelerated weathering, where, weather, uh, where water, water sorry, is often not very well specified in test standards. We said before that light initiates and heat accelerates. Well, we also say that water participates. So in the presence of water, a number of things can happen that don't happen in dry environments. There are different chemical reactions that can take place. There are physical effects that can take place like erosion or absorption or swelling, uh, washing away of products and things like that. So water is not to be overlooked. And I wanna stress that a couple of times throughout this presentation. Water or moisture is present in a few different forms in the environment. We'll talk about three of those. You're probably familiar with all of these, but it's interesting to talk about them um, in the context of how they impact weathering. So humidity is the first one. Humidity is, of course, how much water is present as a vapor in the air. And humidity is something that has to be considered for both indoor and outdoor testing. If you're testing a material, that is only going to be indoors, for example, you don't need to test it against the effects of rainfall, obviously, but you would need to test it against humidity. And one significant impact that relative humidity or humidity has is that it can affect dry off times of uh, specimens. The next is rainfall. And I think everybody uh, knows what rain is, but, well, I hope so, but the reason I present it is it does have several effects on weathering behavior. It, and it can wash away surface layers. So imagine that you have a product that's being photodegraded by sunlight and heat, and you create some reaction product at the surface, then rainfall comes along, washes that away, and exposes this fresh surface. That can then be degraded again by sunlight and heat. So we can serve to accelerate the weathering process in that way. It can also remove dirt or other uh, products of the outdoors that might prevent weathering behavior. So effectively clearing off the surface to be exposed to light and heat. And as mentioned before, rainfall can cause that thermal shock to products. And last but not least is dew or condensation. And this is when moisture that's present in the atmosphere condenses out and forms on the surfaces of materials. This is of course, typically um, it happens overnight. So as temperatures of specimens cool down and Dew has a high oxygen content, which means that it can, in some cases, accelerate weathering behavior. It also has a long dwell time, 
and materials that have condensation have that condensation for a long time and this may form at uh, 10 p.m at night um, and not be removed until 8 a.m so we say that materials are wet for a longer time than most people realize in some environments up to 16 or more hours per day and in fact because of this it's actually dew that is the source of most outdoor wetness rather than rain or relative humidity so often overlooked but something that we really need to consider is that materials are wet for a very long time and the source of that is usually condensation or dew. Unfortunately, not a lot of accelerated lab weathering tests are able to simulate dew. And we'll talk about this more when we get to the section contrasting xenon arc testing with UV fluorescent testing. I'll make the point one more time. Um, we should not underestimate the effect of water or moisture. It can play a big role in a lot of weathering phenomena. It can often change the mode of degradation. If you don't have sufficient water in your test, you may be able to replicate a color change, for instance, or a loss of gloss or tensile change, but you may miss certain failures that actually take place outdoors. Blistering or uh, loss of adhesion, swelling, things like that. So. To get all the modes of degradation that outdoor materials experience, it's important to consider moisture in testing. It can change the rate, as well as a number of reactions take place more quickly in solution than they do without the presence of water. And that third bullet, uh, which we'll come back to later, is that it can be difficult to accelerate the effect of moisture. So with a radiance or light, it's relatively straightforward. You just increase the power to your lamps, increase the output of those lamps. Also, uh, you can just turn up the temperature, right? But how does one accelerate water sitting on a specimen for a long period of time? Um, it's kind of a conceptual challenge in weathering testing, and we'll talk more about that later. So to summarize this section, um, as an introduction to weathering, we talked about sunlight, where we're mostly talking about ultraviolet light. It's UV that causes virtually all polymer degradation. It's a small part of the spectrum, but it's a huge part of weathering. And we make the point that even a small change in the spectrum, the light spectrum that a specimen sees, or a small change in the formulation of that material, that can play a big role in how much it degrades. So if you have a weathering test data for a particular material and you make even a small change to that material, it's worth redoing the test to make sure that you haven't lost any sort of weathering resistance that was built into the previous one. And when we add heat, we can increase the rate of degradation. So heat and sunlight often act in synergy. Heat effects uh, are both high temperatures as well as those thermal cycling effects. And we noted that the color of material affects strongly how hot it gets in sunlight. Um, I think everybody probably knew that, but it's good to quantify how much that can change. And finally, we have water, uh, which is often overlooked, but when we have the three of these combined, sunlight, heat, and water, that's what we call weathering. And we're most concerned in the outdoors, but not exclusively with condensation or dew, which is when materials are wet for so long outdoors. It's really, um, it's that that's worth trying to reproduce in an accelerated weathering test. All right, so let's, uh, we'll move on to the second section, um, which is why should we perform laboratory testing? What are some of the goals and what is the motivation behind that? Not everybody has the same objective. So there are a number of different reasons to perform accelerated laboratory weathering. Um, in some cases, it's uh, your customer who wants you to. So a, a lot of customers will say, if you want to supply to me, you have to pass such and such a test standard for so many hours and show this small amount of degradation. And if you can do that, well, then I'll buy from you. But if you don't, then I won't. So in some cases, it may be your own product that you want to put in the market but you want to have some confidence in its performance, right? So you now enhance your reputation, improve the durability, uh, make sure that what you're putting out into the marketplace really is durable and has a really long-term performance if that's what that you expect. So there are lots of different reasons why people test, but in the end, they all are methods to help you make better decisions. So we call it a tool for directional decision-making. Should I use this UV stabilizer or not? Should I buy from the supplier or not? Uh, when I'm pursuing a research direction for a new product, should I go this way or should I go that way? Uh, 
but it's intended to help you make uh, decisions to better reduce your risk of making bad decisions and to help accelerate the time frame in which you can make those decisions. Uh, what it doesn't do, and I'll get to the most common question that's asked to both Thermaline and QLab is, what it doesn't do is correlate directly to a service life outdoors. Um, the question that we get very frequently, and it's a very understandable question, is for example, how long do I have to run a test in a xenon device or a UV fluorescent device so that I can say that my product will last 10 years or 15 years outdoors? Um, okay, so those simple numerical correlations like that for the most part, really don't exist. Uh, if there were a magic number like that, I could save us all an hour. I'll just tell you right now. So really, what you have to do is have that long-term natural outdoor weathering data as a benchmark for comparison run uh, laboratory tests and then start to build some correlative factors between those. But going into testing, it's important to set expectations. And if you're expecting to have direct numerical correlations for accelerated uh, factors, you may be dis disappointed in testing. Now that said, it can produce a lot of very powerful data that can really help you make better decisions about your products. So we've classified accelerated testing into four broad categories and I'll show, um, I'll show you these in, a, in this little matrix here. So the first one, which is by far the most common way to run weathering in uh, corrosion testing is quality control testing. So this is a simple pass fail test. It's got a short defined time frame, and it's compared to some specifications. So uh, the customer says, run the standard for a thousand hours and your color change has to be less than this amount. And if you do, you're good. If you don't, then we won't buy from you. So likewise, you may be trying to qualify something that's coming in from a supplier. Um, so if you buy something and you know it's supposed to have a UV stabilizer, each time a lot comes in, run a weathering test. If it passes that test, then good. It's got the stabilizer. If it doesn't, well, you, you may need to have a call with your supplier. Now the second category is quite similar which is uh, qualification or validation. So if becoming qualified to be a supplier or having your product validated by a customer is important, then this testing is also pass fail. It's going to be a, a more straightforward kind of a test. Although typically it may not be 100% realistic with respect to an outdoor environment. And these might be a little longer tests and here you're going to compare to either a specification like before or to some reference material, which could be a material of yours that you know is good, or it could even be a competitive material that you're trying to compete against and exceed the performance of. The third kind is um, below this intentionally heavy black line, and it's correlative testing. And this is where I think a lot of our customers are starting to drive towards, even though most of them still probably do the top two levels, but to really understand outdoor product performance, you need to start building correlative relationships between lab testing and outdoor testing. Uh, what this gives you is what we call rank ordered data, meaning that if I test 10 different types of specimens in the lab, and I test 10 different types of specimens in the outdoor environment, I'll, I'll then rank them from one to 10. Um, how well do those lists of 10 match up? So rather than having a 10 to one or a 20 to one, a time factor between the two. The disadvantage um, here, if you want to think of it that way, is that you do have to take the time and do the natural exposures, which can take a long time. It takes years, and we would suggest that you get exposures outdoors as soon as possible for any real test program. But the advantage is that you get much more powerful data out of this kind of a test. Then at the very bottom is what we call service life prediction or uh, acceleration factor generation. So again, this is going to be longer testing. It's going to take more time. Uh, an open-ended program absolutely has to have the natural test data to correlate to. So very few of our customers, I would say, have ever reached that level of predictive testing. Generally speaking, it's better shoot for a more realistic correlative test build that library of rank order data uh, for a whole lot of specimens rather than taking the time for just a couple of specimens, getting predictive data. And then once you make a formula change, having to start all over again. So again, 
it depends entirely on your goals. So when we talk about natural weathering, we're talking about outdoor exposure, of course, and we're talking about unconcentrated sunlight. So the idea is to understand how environmental factors affect your products outdoors. And as I said in the outset, there are three benchmark weathering sites that we refer to. We've got um, the subtropical in Florida, which is pretty much always very hot, very humid, very sunny. Um, Arizona is hotter. It's brighter still, but it's very dry. And up in the Midwest where the QLab headquarters are, there's this uh, four seasons kind of temperate climate. Why is it important to do natural weathering? Um, well, natural weathering really is the true benchmark. It's more complex than artificial weathering. There are more factors outdoors than we could possibly reproduce in any scientific instrument. And as a result, uh, accelerated tests aren't always realistic. In fact, a lot of the ones that were developed many years ago that are still in wide use uh, are known to be extremely non-correlative. Nevertheless, they've been run for a, a long time and there's a lot of history behind them. So people continue to run them. So if you want to trust your lab tests, it's important to verify those lab tests with outdoor testing. So that's the motivation on why we would like to perform lab testing. Um, now let's get into the main laboratory weathering test methods, which are the xenon arc testing and fluorescent UV testing. We'll start with xenon arc. Xenon arc testing has been around for uh, over a hundred years, I believe, or at least at least around a hundred years. Uh, there are two main architectures. One we call the rotating rack type, which is on the left of your screen. Uh, the other we call a flat array type, which is on the right. In the rotating rack, as the name implies, there's a rack that specimens are placed on that rotates around the xenon lamp which is in the center of the chamber, and that's uh, placed vertically. So you can see that water can be sprayed on specimens either front or back, as in the schematic there. There's also the flat array type tester here, um, where the lamps are horizontal, and they shine down on the specimens, which are arranged on that horizontal tray. Water spray in this tester is downward. Um, in both testers, we control the irradiance, we control the temperature of the specimens, and the chamber air as well. And we'll talk about that in a second. And in both cases, we have a light monitor so that we can see how much light is being output and uh, control that throughout the duration of the test. There are two basic types of xenon arc lamps and both produce essentially the same spectrum, right? Um, it's just that, that gas, the xenon uh, gas that determines the spectrum. And on the left, we've got what's called an air-cooled lamp. And just as the name implies, the xenon lamp, uh, they put out a lot of heat, uh, a lot of power, and they need to be cooled actively. So some of them are cooled just by airflow past the lamp in the center. And the right side, we've got the water-cooled lamps, which are, um, again, what they sound like. So the lamp uh, itself is shown in the center, and it's assembled into what we call the water-cooled lamp assembly at the far right, so that water can flow through that jacket, cool the lamp actively. Now, both types of test, uh, test architecture shown here um, and both types of lamp cooling are allowed in the vast majority of international standards today, as well as standards by um, you know, most large companies. And to obtain a realistic light spectrum from a xenon lamp, we have to do some modifications. We can't just expose specimens to a bare xenon lamp and expect a good test. So xenon has a spectrum very similar to sunlight. However, it's a spectrum similar to sunlight before being filtered by our ozone layer. So we have to do some control of the spectrum. And the way we accomplish that is with optical filters. And I'll talk a, a little more about those in the next few slides. Uh, we also control the irradiance level. So for the intensity of the test, do we want to run approximately at the level of the sun or do we want to in even increase it further than that? Uh, do we want to run lower irradiance for a longer period of time? We also need to specify where the irradiance is controlled. And I can say that the irradiance should be at uh, 0.6 watts per meter squared, but I need to tell you at what wavelength that is to determine the rest of the spectrum. And finally, we need to consider lamp aging. 
uh, the spectrum of xenon arc lamps changes over time. It does not stay constant. And what happens is the control point stays fixed by definition, but over time, some degree of that short wave ultraviolet is lost. And when it, it decreases and the amount of visible infrared increases, this is inherent to all xenon arc lamps. Our testers do this, our competitors testers do this. And for this reason, it's very important to regularly replace lamps with fresh ones so that you're not underexposing specimens to UV and then just overheating them. Uh, there are three broad classifications of filters that we define. And in each case, you can see uh, what it looks like for a rotating rack tester in that left photo. It's that lantern that goes around the centralized lamp. For a flat array tester, it's a flat pane of glass that sits between the lamp and the specimens. Um, the three glasses are called daylight, window, and extended UV. The extended UV extends the UV to shorter and shorter wavelengths relative to the sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface. So here on slide uh, 48, you can see the thin black line which represents the sun outdoors. You can see that the two extended UV filters indicated on this chart have significantly shorter ultraviolet light than the sun. So this may give you a faster test, but it may also give you an unrealistic um, unrealistic test and, and product failure. So if a product failure is caused by irradiance at 290 nanometers, you're not going to see that here on the Earth's surface, but you may see it in this test. The next glass is called uh, daylight filter. And as the name implies, it's meant to mimic daylight outdoor solar spectrum. In this case, we've got the solar spectrum again with the thin black line and a variety of different daylight filters in you can see that each of them has roughly the same cut on value as the sun. So not too much short wavelength, but not too little either. There are some differences here. Some legacy borosilicate glass filters have a little bit more short wave, uh, which can affect test results. Whereas there are some more modern daylight filters that better match at more exactly the cut on of natural sunlight. And the third type uh, called window. And as you might expect, they mimic sunlight through window glass. Uh, there are a number of different types of window filters as there are a number of different types of glass. And we've got one here, for instance, called our window Q filter. It's meant to mimic the cut on of a three millimeter clear transparent glass. Um, other ones can mimic tinted glass or thicker glass or even glass of different composition and so on. So there are a number of different filters and each window filter is meant to represent the solar spectrum through a pane of glass. Optical filters may or may not age depending on your test system. Um, if you've got a water cooled test, is, uh, test system, um, so water cooled xenon lamps, it's likely that you will have to replace your optical filters and the time frame for that may vary somewhere between 400 to 1000 hours. There are contaminants in the water cooled lamps that eventually will build up and affect your spectrum. So those filters do need to be replaced. That's not the case for air cooled lamp systems. Um, those filters do not age. They don't need to be replaced, which is nice. All the testers manufactured by QLab are air cooled and the QLab filters don't ever need to be replaced. So the irradiance is controlled in a xenon device by an irradiance feedback system, okay? So there's a control loop. Power is delivered to the lamps by the main controller through ballasts, and that light is measured by onboard irradiance sensors, which are calibrated frequently. Uh, those sensors then feed that information back to the main controller, which adjusts the power input to the lamp as necessary, so that throughout an entire test, you can meet precisely the irradiance, uh, irradiance set point that's called for in the test standard. Um, there are three common irradiance control points and I realize I've listed uh, four here, but the first three are the most common. And there's what's called a narrow band control point where you specify what the irradiance is going to be at 340 nanometers or 420 nanometers and the rest of the spectrum is determined from that. So normally you'd pick a 340 for a daylight type exposure where short wave UV is of most concern. Uh, 420 you might pick for a behind glass filter. So you pick a longer wavelength for that control. 
or if you're not certain or you want something that representative uh, of all specimens, you might choose a TUV. So that integrates the entire irradiance over a band, uh, 300 to 400 nanometers and gives you a value in uh, watts per meter squared. I made the comment at the bottom that some tests, uh, very few of them are controlled by what's called a global irradiance, which is the full range from 300 to 800 nanometers. Uh, the QLab testers don't do this. We don't recommend it. Um, what it ends up doing is overweighting the visible and long wave UV portion of the spectrum, which really have in most cases very little to do with weathering. So it's more important to focus on uh, one of the narrow band or that TUV range. It's important to choose an appropriate control point because as I mentioned, the lamps do age with use and will manifest itself in a different way depending on which of the control wavelengths or band wavelengths you choose. So lamp life is uh, limited by a spectral shift. Again, this isn't just QLab lamps. This is inherent to all xenon testing. Uh, we recommend lamp replacement every 1500 hours. Um, if you don't do that, you're likely to expose your specimens to too little UV light, not a harsh enough test, and you may pass some specimens that shouldn't even be passing. So the general guidance is to follow what the standard you're running says. Outside of that, the controller irradiance wavelength um, region of interest, if you're concerned with color fade with potentially longer wavelengths, then choose 420. If you're concerned with shorter wavelengths, such as UV degradation or physical property changes, then go with that 340 nanometer. If you're not certain, or you just want to um, have a broad general test, then you could choose the TUV. So that's a radiance control. Uh, we also need to control the temperature in a xenon arc device, and that's typically done by use of what's called a black panel. Uh, nearly every xenon arc tester standard calls for a black panel temperature control. So what it's meant to do is sort of uh, approximate the maximum specimen temperature. So uh, because these are painted black, they're going to absorb a lot of energy from the xenon lamps. And more importantly though, they're used to, um, used to make sure that test to test are in lab to lab, uh, you're running the test consistently each time. So it's uh, just a way to standardize on machines. Black panels look like what you see here on slide 56. At the top row is what's called either an uninsulated black panel in the US or a black panel elsewhere in the world. It's, it's exactly what it looks like. It's a, a black painted piece of stainless steel. So below that is a, a black panel that's mounted onto a piece of white polymer. You'll usually choose these again, depending on what your test standard says, but also depending on your material. So for example, if you're testing painted uh, metal panels, you probably want to choose that top row, the black panel. If you're looking at plastics, you may choose the insulated version. The general guidance for choosing temperatures is if you want to maximize your acceleration, if you want to get the best accelerated test, get up near um, or at the maximum service temperature of your material. So if your specimens reach 90 degrees outdoors, then you can choose a 90 degree set point for your test. However, we don't recommend that you go higher than that, or you might start to see uh, failures that you wouldn't see outdoors. And that's, especially with polymers, they might even start to soften or melt. Chamber air temperature control uh, sometimes is used in conjunction with the black panel temperature control. Some test methods require this. In many cases, it's just so that they can specify a relative humidity. And you cannot specify a relative humidity if you don't know what the temperature is of the air. So one, not, uh, one note is that um, in a xenon device, the black panel temperature is always going to exceed the chamber air temperature because that black panel is going to absorb that radiant heat uh, from the lamps and the air is not. I mentioned that uh, relative humidity control then often comes along with chamber air temperature control. And a lot of test methods require you to do this. So in particular, uh, ones where moisture in the air might affect the test like textiles. Um, our general comment is that for a lot of materials compared to the amount of water that's delivered during a spray cycle, uh, the presence of relative humidity isn't going to make a big difference. So whether you're running at 70% or 50 or 40%, it's probably not going to impact uh, significantly your test results, but 
what it may impact is that dry off time. So you may uh, affect time of wetness by running a 90% step versus a 20% step. Generally speaking, uh, for xenon testing, it's going to be water spray that's responsible for most of the water delivery in the testing. And the most common way to uh, sprinkle water on specimens is that front spray, okay? So um, that's the primary method in a lot of historical test standards that, that call for spray. They don't get much guidance on the pressure or the type uh, or the volume of water. They just say spray for a certain amount of time. More recently, a standard called uh, ASTM D7869 has a technique for calibrating water delivery, just like the way that radiance and temperature have been calibrated for some time. And one particular standard, which is uh, SAE uh, J2527, uh, that also calls for back spray. And the idea was to use back spray to cool specimens and generate condensation on the front. And it doesn't really do that. And in fact, uh, that standard calls for both front and back spray simultaneously. So it's one where um, this has been done for so long that people continue to do that. So it remains popular despite not really being scientifically valid. Um, in some cases where people want to deliver an acid or a soap or some other solution, there's dual spray um, for that. And for some materials that exist in aqueous environments like rooftops or ceilings, you may choose immersion instead of spray. So keeping specimens effectively uh, dumped in a pool of water while exposing them to, leak, uh, to, to light and heat during the test. So to summarize uh, xenon arc testing, we know that xenon arc is popular because the xenon lamp with optical filters offers the best simulation of the full spectrum sunlight. Um, if you're concerned with short wave UV or long wave UV, even into visible, um, you need to reproduce all of that, then xenon is the way to go. The lamps do age over time, okay? They lose short wave UV and they gain long wave UV um, and or visible and IR over time. They do need to be replaced. So you have to be careful about that. You know, we talked about how temperature can be controlled by black panel and or the chamber air temperature and how water is delivered primarily by front water spray. Relative humidity control is also available and called for in many test standards. Uh, xenon arc testers are a little more expensive. Uh, they can be a little more difficult to maintain, a little more complex than the next technology we'll talk about, which is uh, the fluorescent UV testers. Just got a quick shot here then um, of what the QLab testers look like. They do have three models of QSun um, xenon arc. The XE1 and 3 are both that flat array. The XE2 is the rotating rack type tester. And the XE1 you can see there is a, just a smaller bench top model. So let's move then to fluorescent UV. Here we've got a cross section of the fluorescent UV tester and we're looking edge on. So you can see that there are eight lamps. So four in the front, four in the back. Um, they're aimed directly at test specimens, which are those heavy black angled lines. The interesting thing about the construction here is that the test specimens actually form the walls of the chamber. And the advantage of that is that they're exposed to this hot vapor that's generated during condensation steps. Their backs are cooled by the laboratory air. Um, there's a gap between the specimen and that door, which means that condensation forms on the front of the panel. So a major advantage of a fluorescent UV tester is not only can it generate UV light, but it also forms that hot condensation on specimens. And uh, well, there's, a, there's a front view of a, a QUV weathering tester there. In the xenon testers, we control the spectrum by use of filters. Uh, in, with the QUV or if any UV fluorescent device, we control with a choice of lamps. So you can see we've got four. Um, the UVA340 corresponds roughly to daylight filters in the xenon. UVA351 lamp is like a window filter. And the UVB313 lamp is like an extended UV filter. Uh, well, we also offer a cool white, which simulates indoor office environments, which is uh, not nearly as widely used because specimens typically don't degrade very much inside an office. If we look at these, uh, 
you can see the chief advantage of UVA 340 is that it's an excellent match for natural sunlight in, the, uh, in that short wave UV portion of the spectrum. So if you have durable materials that are only failing because of UV light, which is most materials, then this is a great choice. It's easy to accelerate this to increase the irradiance and you can see that the cut on match is nearly perfect. Above 350 nanometers, not so much, but again, if your specimens are sensitive in that short wavelength region, uh, then this is an excellent choice. The UVA351 shifts a bit to the longer wavelength, so you can see these match very well uh, to sunlight behind a clear uh, window glass. Finally, we've got the UVB313 lamps, and you can see that this doesn't match the sunlight spectrum really at all. I mean, it's not really meant to. The UVB313 is for harsh, fast testing. And if you're trying to correlate to outdoor exposures, then this is not the lamp recommended. If you want to run a quick test and uh, just break something, then this is the lamp. As with the Xenon testers, the, the, uh, the QUV has automatic irradiance control. Most of the models do. Again, it's the same principle. Power is delivered to the lamps. The UV sensors that are integrated into the tester record that irradiance, send that information to the main controller, which then adjusts the power supply to the lamps uh, to keep that irradiance constant throughout your entire test. So there are some very good reasons to choose a fluorescent lamps. Uh, you get fast results from them, which is nice. It's easy to increase the irradiance pretty high, again, only in the ultraviolet region. Um, and irradiance control is pretty straightforward. It's very easy to measure. An advantage is that these lamps don't age in the same way that xenon lamps age. So as the shape of the spectrum changes over time for a xenon amp, that's not the case for a fluorescent lamp. They may decrease in output over time um, and you may then need to put uh, more power into the lamps, which the controller handles, but the shape of that spectrum, the character of it doesn't change over time. In fact, QLab warrant the fluorescent lamps for at least 8,000 hours of uh, light operation, which is great. Um, maintenance and calibration is very easy. I think, it's, I think it's pretty easy in the Xenon devices as well, um, but it's easier still in the fluorescent device. It's relatively inexpensive to purchase and maintain. It's easy to operate and set up as well. So the QUV can run with tap water. Um, you don't need deionized water unless you're running a spray. One thing it doesn't do is distinguish color temperature as effectively as specimens um, outdoors or as in the, in the uh, Xenon device. So you can see the UV fluorescent color temperature chart on that right, um, contrasted with the outdoors. Um, because there's no visible or infrared being generated by the lamps, then heat is not being absorbed by the specimens. And those differences between black and colored and um, and the white specimens are not being reflected. So that's just something, something else to keep in mind. In addition to the ability to accurately reproduce the UV portion of the spectrum, another advantage of the UV fluorescent tester is condensation. So we can um, cause hot condensation again because the specimens form the walls of that chamber and their backs are cooled by the laboratory air. Um, hot condensation can form on their faces, which is continuously refreshed throughout the uh, condensation cycle, um, which can last for a few hours. Some advantages of this is that it's the best match to natural wetness. So if you really want to simulate moisture attack outdoors, hot condensation is probably the best way to do it. And we can run at high temperatures, with, which gives you uh, some acceleration factor, uh, kind of answers my question before about how do we make water sitting on a panel sort of go faster? The answer is heat. Um, it has high oxygen content being distilled out of the air. And the advantage is um, you can't get any debris on those specimens. So it's a natural distilling process by which the condensation is formed. Um, specimens won't get gunk on them like they might from a water spray operation. In some cases though, um, you may want to uh, 
add water spray. So if you have a material like a wood coating, for instance, that's, that's going to absorb a lot of water. You may want to choose a standard that uses water spray. And you can generate that thermal shock erosion. Again, uh, you can produce a much higher volume of water for specimens that are going to see that water outdoors. And in this case, you definitely would need to have deionized water supply. Um, just like the xenon, you, you can't use tap water with water spray. So a quick summary of fluorescent UV testing then. The UVA340 are the most common lamps. It's the best simulation of the short wave portion of the ultraviolet spectrum. Again, it doesn't generate visible light. It doesn't generate uh, infrared. If you want to run a faster, more severe, but perhaps less realistic test, then the UVB um, lamps are available. These lamps don't age over time, which is nice. Eventually, they have to be replaced, but their spectrum, uh, it doesn't shift over their entire lifetime. Uh, the UV fluorescent devices have the ability to produce hot condensation, which is uh, realistic as well as strenuous for materials and relative humidity can't be controlled in a fluorescent UV, but uh, water spray is available for some specialized tests. Uh, and uh, here's a nice photo of uh, the flagship model, the, the QUV SE. So we've just got a couple more slides uh, to wrap up again, um, wrapping up the, the comparison between fluorescent UV and Xenon Arc. We consider these to be complementary technologies. I wouldn't say that one is better than the other in any way. Uh, different goals or different tester types. And in many cases, uh, companies that do a lot of weathering testing will almost certainly have both of these devices. Uh, fluorescent UV has the best simulation of the shortwave UV uh, with the UVA340 lamps. Xenon Arc's major advantage though is that it does reproduce the full spectrum UV, uh, visible and, and IR. The spectrum doesn't change for fluorescent lamps. It does for xenon. Um, the XC2 and the XC3 can control relative humidity. Um, in fluorescent devices, that's not possible. However, the fluorescent UV um, can produce condensation, which xenon arc testers cannot. So either one can be equipped with a water spray, although it's much more common in xenon arc standards. And uh, the fluorescent UV does have some advantages in cost and maintenance. So just a couple more slides. Um, here we'll touch on what makes an effective testing program. So thinking back to our test matrix, uh, what kind of test should I run? Keep this in mind as you approach developing a weathering test program. Are you interested in running uh, a quality control type program? Uh, quick screening of materials, yes, no, pass, fail. Um, or are you trying to build a more correlative set of data where you understand how specimens are performing outdoors and how you can best simulate and shorten that time in a laboratory. If we're doing one of the tests below the line, um, which are going to take more time, it's imperative that you have outdoor data as a reference for your correlative and your predictive uh, testing. So when you choose a test, make sure that you understand what kind of service environment it is. Test are designed for specific environments, be that indoor, outdoor, wet, dry, hot, cold. And if you choose one for an environment that your specimen is not going to be present in, it's unlikely then that your lab test will correspond with your actual field failures or your outdoor testing. So a few best practices that we recommend for uh, lab weathering. One is to run until failure, okay? So if you stop a test at an artificially early time, you might not gain the full information you could get from the test. So run until you get to a particular failure mode. Understand what the failure mode is as well. If your lab test is producing color change, but your specimens are, are then cracking outdoors, then it's not a very good correlation. You, you haven't designed that lab test correctly and, probably need to make an adjustment. So make sure to use replicates. You don't want to stake uh, your product's reputation on a single specimen. Of course, it's important to do evaluations frequently, whether you're doing color measurements or gloss measurements or you know, using tensile poles, whatever that is. Um, also remember that weathering is not always a linear process. So in many cases, a specimen can be perfectly good for a thousand hours in the test and that, uh, 1100 hours completely just fall off right so in fact 
it, that's very common and we recommend uh, repositioning specimens frequently for best uniformity, regardless of whether you're using a fluorescent UV device. A rotating rack um, tester or the flat array tester, it's always best to reposition. Um, and then finally, determine what the best test and tester type is for you. So what standard are you running to? What does it say you, that you need to run? Uh, is it important for you to apply a full spectrum sunlight like in the xenon, or are you mostly just concerned with the UV light? And how important is water uptake? Do you even need a spray cycle? Do you need to run long condensation steps or are your materials mostly experiencing photo degradation? Um, can you just get away with light and heat? So the more of this you can answer up front, the better test program you can put together. So with that, uh, we'll wrap up the webinar there. Uh, I'm going to go on mute for a moment and we'll hang out here for a bit to answer any questions via the Q&A. Uh, if you've got any longer winded questions, I encourage you to just email them through to me. Uh, you can see my email there. It's stephen at thermaline.com.au. Um, I'll answer as quickly as I can. And just a final reminder, we will send a PDF of the slides uh, sometime over the next day or so. Uh, but thank you for your time. Thanks for your attention. And um, we'll talk soon. I'll jump back on and just answer one question that we've seen come through at least once and once and it, um, it comes up quite a bit. The question is, uh, why would one choose a rotating rack type tester versus the flat array type tester? Um, at QLab and here at Thermaline, we're pretty agnostic about which of those we prefer or which we recommend. Um, sometimes it's up to the customer. Some have a preference or some feel that the rotating rack tester has better uniformity because it's uh, you know, continuously in motion. It's, that's not really the case. We don't believe that to be the case for our testers. We have a very good irradiance uh, uniformity, which is improved further if you reposition, which you should do in either type. So really, it's up to the customer's preference whether they choose flat array or rotating rack. Again, uh, most international test standards allow for both kinds. So that's reflective of the fact that as long as you're delivering the right amount of irradiance, the right temperature, and the right uh, water delivery, um, you're running the test correctly. So um, thanks uh, once more for your attendance. We really appreciate it. Uh, have a great day.